And sexual abusers are very good at keeping children quiet. Okay. So dads, we need to know these three things. A sexual abuse victim is usually holding on to three pieces of information in my experience. Okay. I don't care if the, if the person being victimized is five or 65 at the time I have the conversation. The first thing that person is holding on to is also the number one reason why children don't tell or sexual abuse victims don't tell. And the number one reason is no one will believe me. You know what's sad about that, dads? Most of the times we don't. Study came out about four years ago. Guess how many times on average a child needed to make an outcry before a criminal investigation would start? Answer, seven times. Episode number 87. You can get all the show notes and resources at dadhackers.us slash 087. What's up, Dad Hackers? My name is Patrick Antonucci, and I am the host and founder of this podcast and community of Dad Hackers. Dad Hackers is a community of Christian fathers who are devoted to encouraging, equipping, and enabling one another to become the men that God has created and called us to be so that we can raise up the next generation of fully devoted followers of Christ and leave a legacy of multi-generational faithfulness. Now, on this show, we primarily interview Christian men to dive deep into their experiences and insights into what it means to be a Christian man, a Christian husband, a Christian father, and a Christian leader. We ask questions that dig deep into the thinking and rationale and experiences of these men so that we can all learn and grow into the men that God is calling us to be. I'm so thankful that you've joined us today. Make sure you subscribe so that you never miss any of our value-packed episodes. Also, please make sure you leave an honest review if you're listening to this in iTunes or any other platform that takes reviews. Reviews boost the show's ratings, which means that more dads are going to come across our show and benefit from the content that we put out. I also wanted to let you know that we do have a free private Facebook group just for Christian dads. So after the show, make sure you hop on over to the show notes. There's a link for that in there as well. All right, guys, we have Greg back with us today for the second part of our interview on protecting our children from sexual predators and being aware of uh, sexual abuse situations, sexual uh, abuse um, it j just giving us a context for how to approach this subject um, as fathers. And Greg has given us such valuable, valuable information, and he was gracious, gracious enough to come back on the show again to do a second part. And in this episode, we're going to dive deeper into what does the grooming process look like, what are some of the warning signs, and then we'll we'll look at a couple other things as we wrap up this episode. And Greg, thank you so much for coming back on the show today. I really appreciate it. How are you doing today, man? Doing all right, Patrick. Awesome, awesome. So last time we really dived deep into the distinction between the abduction offender and the preferential offender. And you talked about how there's really four different types of offenders. And the abduction offender is what a lot of people are really scared of that guy. That's the stranger danger, but that really only accounts for four percent of the of the of the cases. And what did you say the percentage of the preferential offender was? Yes, yeah, ninety four percent. Ninety four. And then we got to make we got to make a small amount of room for what we call the sadistic offender and the situational offender. But yeah, the the preferential offender is our problem. Right, right. And, and from the feedback that I've gotten from the first uh, interview, the, the first conversation that we had, and just from different things that you've said, is that lots of times the, the preferential offender isn't even on our radar, but there's warning signs that we need to be made aware of. We're just not looking for them. And like you said, you, you build the fence based on the things that you want to keep out. And unfortunately, most of the time we're building the wrong kind of fence. Right. And the discussion we're going to have today is, okay, we talked about the fact that the type of fence you build is driven by what you want to keep out. And the first time we discussed this, we were talking about ways in which we, we muff this. Okay. 
ways in which we're not doing this well, the misconceptions and the ideas that we have about the risk, which lead to what we do and how that's wrong. So <clears throat> for all those people that all you did was listen to the first exchange, you're probably like, oh my gosh, I'm depressed. When is he going to do like session two? But a lot of this session that we're going to do today is going to depend on an understanding of what we discussed last time, which is most of us are geared toward protecting our children from the abduction offender, which is 4% of the problem. And like, I don't get me wrong. I want to protect my child from the abduction offender. Right. And when I'm going trick or treating with my child, when she's small, everybody's a perp. Okay. I want to protect my kid from anyone, you know, but it's generally the barriers are the lowest where the information is the weakest. Okay, so sexual abusers, the preferential offender is going to seek access where the barriers are the lowest. And sadly, the audience you're trying to reach and communicate to, Patrick, are Christian fathers. And the sad reality of what I find in my work is sexual abusers seek access where the barriers are the lowest. And the two places where the barriers are the lowest is at church and at home because those are the two places that we want to know that we can finally go somewhere and turn it off we want to know that we can go somewhere and close our eyes and just rest but part of the things that you and i discussed last time and we're going to continue to discuss is we just don't ever close our eyes we keep our eyes open but now the best question is keep my eyes open for what Okay. Right. What do I need to see? And what you and I talked about last time when we checked the back of the math book is the grooming process is the key. I want you to keep your eyes open and look for grooming, which is why I want to spend the time today. It's like, okay, <clears throat> we discussed every way in which we can do this wrong in session number one. Now let's talk about how we do this right. Okay. So remember what we want to protect our children from dads is the preferential offender. How do I recognize the preferential offender? We can't recognize the preferential offender visually. We must understand who the preferential offender is behaviorally. Okay? So that's how the back of the math book starts to become more clear to me. That's how the answer starts to make sense. I have my eyes open looking for grooming. Even if the grooming comes from someone who's educated, attractive, articulate, a family member, somebody I trust and have gathered into the community that my child has access to, okay? We look for grooming. All right, what is grooming? All right, now, when I ask most people, hey, have you heard the term grooming? Most people will tell me, yeah, I've heard that term before. It's like, oh, yeah, well, what do you think it means? Now, most people can struggle through a definition saying, well, you know, it's the, it's the behaviors that a, a, an abuser will go through to prepare a child for inappropriate sexual touch. And in response to that, I would tell you, you're mostly right. Okay, but really what I want to do is get you to exactly right. Okay, so since we're only talking about the preferential offender, part of the observation I want to make here is, the preferential offender does not groom using force and violence. That's the abduction offender. The preferential offender will groom using manipulation and deception. Okay? Manipulation and deception. Okay, so with that being said, let's get up to 30,000 feet. Here's what I want my dads to understand. The grooming process has two big efforts involved. Now. The grooming of the child is certainly one of those important efforts. But the other effort is <laughs> grooming the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a grooming of the child, but there's also the grooming of the gatekeepers. Now, of course, Patrick, who are the gatekeepers? What is a gatekeeper? That's somebody who can grant access to the child. So like a teacher or uh, a parent, somebody that's, in charge or responsible for the child, uh, that would be a gatekeeper. That's right. Parents, coaches, teachers, youth workers, babysitter, anybody through whom an abuser has to go to gain access to a child is a gatekeeper. Okay, now watch this. The grooming of the child can look different 
depending on the age, sex, and circumstance of the child. The grooming of the gatekeeper generally always looks the same. It's the abuser wanting to convince the gatekeeper that this person is helpful, trustworthy, and kind. Now, isn't that a kick in the pants? Mm -hmm. See, I want people to convince me they're helpful, trustworthy, and kind. Someone comes up to me and says, hey, Greg, I'm a dirtbag. You want to do life? It's like, let me think about it. <laughs> uh, no. All right, so helpful, trustworthy, and kind is what the abuser is going to do to groom the gatekeepers. All right, now, stop. The takeaway so far is not that if someone is helpful, trustworthy, and kind, they might be a perp. Okay, you might be thinking, hey, that dude who moved in next door, he's helpful, trustworthy, and kind. I wonder if he's a perp. Okay, yeah. the point is simply at this juncture, just because somebody is helpful, trustworthy, and kind does not mean we close our eyes because that is the propensity that we have that we discussed in the first session. When someone is educated, attractive, and articulate, it disarms us. What I need us to understand is just because someone is educated, attractive, and articulate, just because someone is helpful, trustworthy, and kind is no reason, dads, to close your eyes. Our eyes always stay open until Jesus comes back. And our eyes are open for seeing the grooming process. So just take inventory of the fact that Usually before any child is groomed and abused, the gatekeeper was groomed first. Can't tell you how many parents I've come alongside that once they start to understand the whole process and realize that they were groomed too, there's a lot of corresponding guilt that comes with that. But I just want you to know the abuser is manipulative and deception and generally, dads, you are one of the first people to be manipulated and deceived because somebody, and, and now we need to pull some of the information we discussed last time, Patrick. Remember, the preferential offender knows you don't get access to my child by simply coming as a stranger to my front door and knocking on the door. Say, excuse me, sir, that's a pretty little girl out there. Can I take her home? That is not the way that works. That's the way you get shot in my neighborhood, right? What the abuser knows is the abuser wants to first get on the wall of my life. You see, once the abuser grooms me by being helpful, trustworthy, and kind, which is the currency into my community. Do you get that? That's the currency into my community. Once someone has convinced me helpful, trustworthy, and kind, now you're on the wall of my life. Once somebody's on the wall of my life, guess what automatically happens? The barriers to my car go down. Barriers to my stuff, my dog go down, and the barriers to our children go down. So what the abuser, first step of the grooming process involves grooming the gatekeepers to get on the wall. Because once that person's on the wall, too many times, dads, we do the work for him or her. Because we're dropping the barriers. We want to know that there are some people, places, or circumstances where I can just close my eyes. Now, the good news in all of this is today we're going to open our eyes and we're going to keep them open. And as long as our eyes are open, then we don't have to worry whether or not someone is helpful, trustworthy, and kind, whether they're authentic in their trustworthiness, whether they're trying to manipulate it. Just look for the grooming process. Okay. So we're still at 30,000 feet. The abuser is going to groom the child and groom the gatekeepers. Now, I'm going to make a statement in terms of step one of the grooming process that's not going to make sense until I explain. Okay, I'm just telling you in advance. You're just like, well, uh, normally it's the social contract. I'm going to nod and smile at you. Like, yeah, I understood that completely. This next statement I'm going to make, you're not going to understand until I explain it. Okay, so now we're talking about the preferential offender which means we're talking about somebody who has a deviant sexual desire for a child within the age and sexual preference. Okay, so what the abuser wants to know, Patrick, is where are there children within my age and sexual preference? Okay, so if it's some, let's take Jerry Sandusky, for example. If Jerry Sandusky magically showed up at my church 
and wanted to work with children, will Jerry Sandusky want to work with toddlers? Probably not. No. Where will Jerry Sandusky want to work? He's probably going to work with boys and uh, middle school, early high school age type boys. That's, ex that's exactly right. Middle school, early high school, boys if you please. Okay. The reason being is, and here's the statement, age and sex of preference is the driver. Okay. Age and sex of preference is the driver on where the abuser will seek access. So it makes sense when you think about it. Jerry Sandusky, for example, he wants access to children. He's going to ask himself, just like any other preferential offender will ask him or herself, where are the children within my age and sexual preference? And that is going to be where that person seeks to volunteer or have a job. Okay. So the first step of the grooming process is gaining access. And they gain access by first deciding where are their children within the age and sex of preference. So for example, if it's somebody that was interested in say five-year-old children, where in our culture are five-year-olds? Yeah. Daycare centers, Daycare mom's day yeah. out, children's ministry, pre-K. Okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's where the children are. That's where that person will seek access. And seeking access generally means that person's going to, they're going to seek a career or volunteer opportunity in that program. Now that sounds way too lawyerly. Okay. What I mean by that is if it's in a program, that person will want to know how hard is it to get a name tag in this pre-K? Jerry Sandusky would want to know how hard is it to get a name tag at your church? How hard is it to get a name tag in your youth sport league? Okay, now, most children are not victimized because a preferential offender got a name tag somewhere, Patrick. Most children are victimized in what we call their core world, okay? Essentially, their home, which is why I'm glad you're doing dad hackers, okay? You're not doing this for the sake of a Christian school. You're not doing this for the sake of a youth sport league or a place where somebody might seek access to a child because they wanted a role in a program. Most children are victimized in their core world, meaning in their home circumstance. You're interested in equipping dads to understand what it looks like if someone yep. wants to give it a go in their family, in their core world. Yeah. And just ancillarily, we want to make sure we understand what it's going to look like if someone wants to give it a go in the youth group or in the, you know, the youth sport organization, whatever. But number one, what the abuser wants to know is where are their children within the age and sexual preference. All right. Now, that person will then appear to be helpful, trustworthy, and kind. That person's going to groom the gatekeepers <clears throat> by being helpful, by being trustworthy. And then once again, that makes sense to us because we've already set it up. We understand. Why is the abuser being so dang helpful? Why is that person making me think, how in the world did I possibly do this program without this person involved before? That person yeah. want, knows that convincing you and me that they're helpful, trustworthy, and kind is the way you get on the wall. Okay? So the first step in gaining access is that person finding where are their children within the age and sex of preference, the stream of commerce, and then find out how to get into that home, get into that program, win that family's trust. All right. Now, that person will also know, depending, remember, age and sex of preference is the driver. If it's someone with an interest in, say, eight-year-old boys, they'll know a whole lot more about what video games eight-year-old boys are playing than I do. Yeah. Okay, or what action figures are hip, or what movie figure. I mean, they'll know what an eight-year-old boy is interested in. Okay, that'll be the person that's got the, the, the swimming pool, the dirt bikes, the activity, the trampolines, the, the kinds of things gathered where eight-year-old boys will desire to be at that place or engaged in those activities. All right. If it's somebody interested in, say, a teenage girl, okay, it'll be somebody who knows a whole lot more about Justin Bieber's hairdresser than I do, okay? Or what's on their Spotify or what Netflix shows they're binging on or even what codes they use when they text one another, okay? It's inscrutable to me, right? Now, that person will be able to slide into that line of communication easier than I could 
because that person's interested in that age and sex of preference, knowing that communication is very important, knowing what's of interest to that child, and then gathering those things that would be of interest to those child, okay? That child. Now, very important observation to make. I think we touched on this in the first discussion is, most people will see the bad behavior but they won't understand the context of why the behavior is bad. Now we could have short circuited all of this, Patrick, and just talked about what is the list of behaviors I should see and I'll fail you and I'll fail your listeners because see, I've got to give you the context starting with the deviant sexual desire and then the gaining access because you see, I don't know what you're going to see Right. that you're going to identify as problematic. What I really want to do is make the radar more sensitive so that whatever you see, you can yeah. potentially spot it as problematic before someone's nude with a child. Okay. So yeah. the steps of the grooming process starts with gaining access. Now I'm going to telegraph in advance and then I want to take it apart. It's going to be gaining access, selecting the child, introducing nudity and sexual touch, and then keeping the child quiet. Okay, those four steps, one, two, three, four. One, gaining access. Two, selecting the child. Three, introducing nudity and sexual touch. And four, keeping the child quiet. With the fourth one being something that the abuser is weaving into the entire process. Okay, so with that being our overview at 30,000 feet, the first step is the abuser identifying where are their children within my sphere, within my ability to get a job or a position, or even a family friend, someone in the neighborhood, okay? Where is that child within the age and sexual preference, right? That person will then start to win the trust of the gatekeepers that are in charge of those particular programs or families. Dads, we are the primary person in our homes or our families that serve as that gatekeeper. All right. Yeah. Step number one, gaining access. Once the abuser has gained access, now the abuser is looking to select one or more children within the age and sex of preference. So the abuser wants to gain access, then select a child. Now it's important to note, Patrick, just because somebody has gained access by being helpful, trustworthy, and kind, you potentially can't spot that person as a danger yet. That person just looks like anybody else in my world that wants to do community with me. Mm -hmm. And I want people to want to do community with me. But once again, my eyes are open so that I want to watch that which moves around me. But at the same time, Patrick, I am working with my children to participate with me in helping me understand what I need to see and what I need to hear. Okay. So I've already told you what the grooming process is from 30,000 feet, but I'm going to leave that alone. I want to step over here to the side for a moment and talk to you about this is what I did with my child at the same time. So because I know what the grooming process looks like, I'm going to work with my child to help me see what I need to see. Okay. So I want to go back and forth to those like right pedal, left pedal. Okay. okay. So the abuser is going to gain some access. I can't go to my child and say, Hey baby, has anybody been helpful, trustworthy or kind to you? Yeah, daddy, that person over there, get my gun. Okay. That's not the way it works at this level. So the gaining of the access is generally something that you're not necessarily going to perceive as being problematic because that's just the way we do life. The next step of the abuser is selecting one or more children within the age and sexual preference. Now, this is important. What is the abuser looking for? Okay. See, now the abuser is in the stream of commerce. What does the abuser see? What is the child? What are the characteristics? What are the indicators that might alert you to the fact that the abuser is going to target that child first? Okay. Or a primary target. And there's enough studies done now, Patrick, that we understand that what the abuser is looking for primarily is that child who is in one way or another disconnected. That child is on the fringe. That child that does not connect well 
with whatever it is the culture, cultural currency in that particular group of children. Now, I'm implying a group of children. But see, if somebody wants to get into a neighborhood community of families, or if somebody's already a family member, say an uncle, that person's already coming to Christmas, okay? So that person may have already decided the target child within the age and sexual preference, they already have access. And now that person is there, they select that child who's within the age and sexual preference. But let me stay back on my thread of a, a child who's disconnected. Why is the disconnected child the highest risk child? The answer is, it makes sense when you get up to 30,000 feet, because what's the abuser about? The abuser is in a community of children to carve a child away from the herd. Okay, you understood that expression You're in Pennsylvania, and I'm in Texas, but you understood me, right? Okay. Yeah. Looking what for a the target. abuser wants to do is carve a little one away from the herd. Okay, see, even in student ministry where I serve, I mean, I can, I look a lot like the abuser up to a certain point. You see, I walk into our student ministry and I immediately am looking for that kid who's disconnected. So is the abuser. Okay. And once I see that kid who's disconnected, as long as it's a guy, what is my role? My role is to come alongside that young man and say, hey, man, what's your name? What's your story? You know, where do you go to school? You know, how about them cowboys? Depressing, right? You know, so I want to win that child's trust. The abuser is doing the exact same thing. How I identify the child, will approach that child, win that child's trust. But you see, my desire is to win that child's trust, to have that child rejoin the body. The abuser wants to win this child's trust to carve that child away, to meet some level of need, to start introducing the rule breaking, start introducing the, the nudity, the sexual conversation, the touch, with the end game ultimately being the abusive behavior. Okay? So that child who's disconnected is a high-risk kid simply because what the abuser's interested in doing is identifying the child that can be isolated. Now, there's the principle. The child that can be isolated, dad's out there. Is your child one that can be easily isolated? I mean, it's a, there's lots of things that can make a child disconnected. I mean, maybe your kid just doesn't have the stuff some of the other kids have. Maybe it doesn't have the athletic ability, the music, the intelligence, the grades, whatever is the currency in that particular group of children, a child just will not fit in, okay? They will not connect, and the abuser can see that, and that becomes a higher-risk kid. If you have a special needs kid, high-risk kid, you have a kid who's looking for someone to follow and trust, and dads, if we're interested in parenting, I hope that's not our kid. I want my kid to see me as the person to follow and trust. Okay? But what the abuser wants to do is win that child's trust. All right? Now, the child who's the single parent kid, higher risk kid. Now, I hope since this is dad hackers and not mom hackers, that most of the people that are hearing this are dads that are interested in parenting their children. Okay? But we just need to understand the single parent kid is a high risk kid. And from a spiritual warfare standpoint, I hope it makes sense. Because, Patrick, watch how this works. Who's more likely to be an abuser, male or female? I believe it's a male. Right. And in a broken home, who's usually missing? The male. Right. The mother. See, yeah. you got brokenness, you got fracture in a relationship, you have a whole lot of need, and you have somebody with ill intent seemingly sliding right into that role to meet those needs to yeah. a great defect, detriment and harm. Okay, so single parent kid is a high risk kid. So that's meant to prime the pump in your thinking of your people of in my community, in my family, in the kids that I have, they're in my neighborhood. You know, who is the kid that's disconnected? That is a kid that the abuser will see as a primary target, not the only target, but as a primary target. Okay, and what the abuser wants to do is come alongside that child and win that child's trust. And it's amazing how many of these people, like with Jerry Sandusky before he was busted, like, oh my gosh, you know, thank you so much for how you pour into my son and how all these people were seemingly these great mentors to these young men until it comes out that they were sexually abusing them. Okay, so it looks from the outside, which is the abuser's goal, that this person is all that. That I mean, you're such a giver, okay? Yeah. Because they found that kid who was looking for someone to follow and trust, who was in need somehow. So for us to recognize that, dads, 
that it may be that our kids are solid. My kid's trusting me. My kid wants to follow my leadership, but your kid has friends. Okay. You need to watch the community even around your kid's friends. All right. Now I want to introduce another concept at this juncture of the grooming process, which is what the abuser wants to do is set a hook or a double hook. Okay, set a hook. What is a hook? In the context of grooming, what that means is the abuser wants to select that child, okay, start winning that child's trust, engaging that child, communication, banter, the ha ha, and make that child feel like I'm a cool dude, okay? And what the abuser then wants to carefully understand is this is setting a hook, finding out what in that child's world is off limits. Finding out what in that child's home is rule breaking. In other words, what will you get in trouble for? What cool things can we do at my house that your mom, ooh, she'd go over the edge. She found out we were doing this. Okay. Well, you can't watch that Netflix show because of nudity at your house. Dude, we can watch it at my house. Just don't tell anybody. I'm the coolest dad in the block. Okay. I'm the coolest youth pastor around. I'm the coolest dude. Everybody wants to come to my house because we can do these things that we know we can't do at our home. Smoking cigarettes, no problem, dude. You got to wear a glove and lots of mouthwash, dude. We don't want mom to blow us up, okay? It'll become that person that's finding those things in the child's world that are privileges, that are rule-breaking behavior before any nudity is introduced because what the abuser wants to do is set the hook that we don't talk about what happens at my place. Yeah. We don't talk about the things that we do because we'll get in trouble and you don't want to risk the availability of these things you want. And then the abuser, once that hook is set, will add additional forms of rule breaking of nudity, porn, touch, talk. Tracking with me? So the yeah. abuser wants to know what is those things you'll get in trouble for? What are those things you'll get in trouble for at home? Provide that to the kid. Now I'm the cool dude. And then I just wait to make sure the hook is set and then add the other forms of rule breaking that involve nudity and sexual touch. Okay. Then there's a, such a thing as a double hook. All right. Now see the hook is rule breaking behavior. The double hook are the things that present the combination alcohol, porn, and weed are double hooks. Okay. Alcohol is a double hook because you see it's rule breaking by nature, but it also impairs. Weed is a double hook. It's rule breaking by nature and it also impairs. Porn is a double hook. It's rule breaking by nature, but it also arouses. The reason why I point that out is that when the male molester, even the female molester sees there is a boy that is already interested in alcohol, tobacco, porn, and weed, the double hook is much easier to set. Okay? Because the double hook is more valuable to the abuser because you see it's not only rule breaking, but it's impairment. Mm -hmm. So I've got a situation involving, you know, this one particular kid, freak athlete when he was young. Okay? There was a single mom kid. Okay, so I know I'm talking to dads, but dads need to get to see how this pattern works. So this single mom in East Texas, she had a boy that when he was, even when he was little, freak, freak athlete, okay? He could do everything, faster, cleaner, straighter than any other kid. And as he got older, I mean, he was just a kid everybody had to have on their team. And this mom was convinced for him to get his shake in life, she needed to get him into a bigger school district, okay? So he can have better coaching, better facilities, and that's the way the colleges are going to see him so he can actually get a college scholarship. At least that was her thinking. So when he turned 14, she moved him into the bigger school district. You see, now she's driving further to get to work, working harder, faster, cleaner, straighter to be able to provide the resources that he needs to be in this new community. But as a freshman, he makes the varsity baseball team at this big school. All right, so Patrick, when you're a freshman and you make the varsity baseball team, who are your new friends? Uh, upperclassmen, seniors and right. juniors. In, both, in, this, in, this, in this place, mostly seniors. Okay, so what would the seniors do on the weekends? They get in their pickup trucks, they drive out in the woods, they burn things, shoot things, and drink beer. Okay, mom starts seeing the Instagram posts and the Facebook posts of her kid passed out with beer cans, you know, stacked on his head or, you know, vomiting in the front yard on a Friday night, and she gets really upset. She goes to the coach, who's a perp, by the way, 
and said, look, ever since he made this team, I mean, the alcohol, and he won't listen to my warnings, and, and I need some help here. And the coach said, all right, ma'am, I got this. I'll tell you what, I'm going to take all the guys out camping this weekend, and we're, we're going to talk about the dangers of alcohol and drugs and the importance of respecting authority. Now, what does single mom say? Oh, that'd be great. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Jesus. Okay? Yeah. So he picks up the young man right on time, and they drove away. Now, when he drove away, does he pick up any other kid? I'm thinking probably not. Nope. Straight out into the woods. And on the way out to the woods, leans over and goes, hey, man, can you keep a secret? Goes, yeah, I can keep a secret. What? He goes, no, man, you can't tell anybody, not even the guys on the team. You got to swear. Dude, I can keep a secret. What's up? I got a 12 packed in bag. All right, now here's the boy's moment of truth. What does he do? Did he call 911? Nope. Did he call mom? Like, nope. No way. It's like me and coach drinking the beer and burning some stuff. This is going to be a good night. So sure enough, on that camp out, there's a lot of beer drinking and a lot of burning stuff. But there was no sexual touch. Now, why is there no sexual touch on the first camp out? Answer, the abuser setting the double hook. Yeah. Giving the child what that child already wants, which involves impairment rule breaking, wants to know if the secrecy will hold. Two weeks go by, he hadn't told a soul. And after you know, two weeks, he goes by the kid to practice. He goes, hey, man, you go camping this weekend? He goes, yeah, man, you bring the beer. It's like, roger that. And picks him up, and they go out in the woods. Now there's a lot of alcohol consumption, and there's a lot of pushing through this young man's objections to sexual touch while he was significantly impaired. See, now. For this young man to come back and tell mom about the inappropriate sexual touch, what does he also have to tell mom about? The drinking. The drinking. How does mom feel about drinking? She is not approving of it. Not a fan. Not now, a fan. Especially if it's a young man. Because you see, for the young man to come back and talk about engaging in same-sex behavior, the way our culture still throws around labels for same-sex behavior, is enough to keep that young man quiet forever. Right. You track with me? Oh, yeah. You know, two camp outs and beer. So in that sense, alcohol is a double hook, meaning it's rule breaking and impairment. Yeah. But the double hook is a phenomenon, especially for boys. Okay. And now let me unpack this a little bit. Now I'm in that vein that starts to talk about and make sense of the thing that I said earlier. The grooming of the gatekeeper generally looks the same, the helpful, trustworthy, and kind. The grooming of the child can look different depending on the age, sex, and circumstance of the child. So that example that I just gave you about setting the hook and then setting the double hook is what I primarily see when the victim is a boy. Double hooks are primarily things that I see when the victim is a boy. Now, we need could have been the same example you know, woven in. It just happened to have been alcohol because that young man was not interested in weed. But you can see the crossover. Mm -hmm. Okay, Porn is a huge tool in the belt of the abuser. Okay, Every case that we've done intake on or I've managed or had to evaluate that involved a male molester and a male victim has involved pornography. Now, some people go, wow. I, you know, I didn't know there was that much homosexual pornography out there. It's like, well, you've missed me. Okay, because the goal of the abuser is not to convince a 12 year old boy that nude men are attractive. It's simply to arouse the boy is to find out what the boy is consuming and give the boy that. Okay, because you see the it's rule breaking and it's arousal. So the double hook here is extremely effective for boys. But I say boys, why not girls? Okay, now I'm going to get back up to 30,000 feet, and I want to talk about one of those statistics we looked at last time. The average male molester who preferred boys will have 150 victims prior to criminal prosecution. The average male molester who prefers girls will have 52 victims prior to criminal prosecution. By way of context, the average male molester begins victimizing at 13 or 14 years old, and the average age of criminal prosecution is 35. Okay, so those are some staggering numbers. But when I discuss that in some of my you know, graduate level courses I teach or when I'm doing pastoral conferences, people asking now why, both of those numbers are unacceptable, okay? But why is there so many more boys than girls? And the answer, 
actually through the studies that I've read and the work that I've done, it's right in line, Patrick, with how God wired us. And that's wow. a crazy answer, isn't it? It's like, it well, is. how did God wire us? How did God wire guys? Visually. <laughs> we're visual and we're easy to stimulate. How did God yeah. wire girls? Uh, more emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Emotionally for a relationship. You know, she's not wired visually the same way boys are. Okay. So because guys are wired visually and easy to stimulate, you see the grooming process is a quicker trip. Okay, it's the arousal, it's the pornography, it's the horseplay, it's the weed, it's the alcohol. The girl, how see, you show a 13 year old boy pornography and his mom's not around and no one will get him in trouble. Is his positive or negative reaction? He probably would have a positive reaction to that. Yeah, at least it's not negative, okay? Yeah. As much as I would want it to be. Right. Now, you show a 13 year old girl pornography and what face does she make? She's probably grossed out. Yeah, she's going to squirrel up her face and she's going to call you a perv. Right. right. She's not wired visually. She's wired emotionally. So the perp who's interested in the teenage girl, you see, porn isn't the tool in the belt of the abuser. The abuser knows you need to first create relationship. Now, the abuser will betray it, sure enough. But you see, to create a relationship takes time. Mm -hmm. It takes effort. And if you want to have a relationship with a teenage girl, what are you going to need? You're going to need a phone. Okay. You're going to need Instagram. You're going to need to text her. You need to understand how teenage girls are having conversation and the abuser will drop right into that line, which generally is going to depend heavily on electronic media and apps. Fair. Okay, let's go back over here with my teenage and my middle school and, and teenage boys. Okay, alcohol, tobacco, porn, and weed are common tools in the belt of the abuser. So really what I want to challenge you is that when you see some of this media account of the perpetrator, okay, pay attention. Because what the media is doing is pulling information from an arrest record. Okay, what did the person do? So oftentimes when the victim is a boy, that's at least middle school, high school, you're going to find that this person groomed the boy using alcohol, tobacco, porn, weed, all of those double hooks. So this one Baptist pastor in Arkansas, Tennessee, and Kentucky, the arrest record shows alleged to have groomed boys using alcohol, marijuana, and pornography. It's like, see, there's the trifecta of the double hooks. Okay, that baseball coach in Brooklyn, alleged to have groomed boys using pornography and alcohol. There's two of the double hooks. You know, that missionary that took a bunch of ministry money and opened an orphanage in Haiti, who was victimizing boys, alleged to have groomed boys with alcohol and porn. Okay, so when the male abuser or female abuser, and it's a male victim, I'm going to find pornography. Well, if it's a female abuser, I'm going to have someone just getting naked. Okay, because that's a live version of pornography. Okay, right, right. But I'm going to find alcohol, tobacco, porn, and weed. So, dads, if you're out there with a teenage boy and you find out there's that cool dude down the block that's letting kids mow yards, and you find out that they're looking at porn together, or they're smoking cigarettes, or they were drinking beer together after a hard day of mowing yards, your radar should be red hot. Okay, alcohol, tobacco, porn, and weed, forms of horseplay, playful touch. Okay. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself because we're talking about gaining access, selecting a child. Who is the, the child that the abuser is going to be more drawn toward? The child who's disconnected, right. looking for someone to follow and trust, single parent home, or a child that's already involved in alcohol, tobacco, porn, and weed because they become options for the double hook. All right. Now, third step of the grooming process is the abuser wants to introduce nudity and sexual touch. Now, even in the examples that I've given you, there is a, there's something going on here that I've described to you, but I haven't labeled it. And now I want to label it. The abuser is going to be engaged in what's called barrier testing and erosion. Barrier testing and erosion. Now, when I say barrier testing, you'll see, Patrick, there's an implication in there. If there's barrier testing, that presumes there is a barrier, barrier. 
to right. be tested. Okay? And what I mean by a barrier is all of us have a sense of what is appropriate. Okay? Appropriate talk, appropriate language, appropriate forms of touch. Okay, so I have a legal assistant right out here. The way that I would touch my wife would not be the same ways that would be appropriate for me to touch my legal assistant. Okay, so sometimes the appropriate forms of touch, depending on, depends on who you are in my life. All right, all of us have a sense of appropriate touch and talk, but we also have an appropriate personal space. Okay. So like the conversation proximity that I can be in when I have a conversation with my wife can be very, very close. My legal assistant, not so much. Okay. Mm -hmm. What the abuser wants to know in any child that's been selected is where is that child's barriers of appropriate? Now, the reason why I had to set it up that way is because so far we've been talking about the teenage boy and I alluded to what it might look like if someone was grooming a teenage girl. But I don't want to miss the opportunity to point out that if somebody were interested in victimizing a teenage girl, middle school or teenage girl, what I'm looking for in terms of grooming are the things that look like someone is developing a relationship. Okay. And if you want to have a relationship with a middle school or teenage girl, chances are you're going to need a phone. You're going to need to text her. I mean, shoot, they could be sitting side by side with each other and they're still texting each other. Okay. So that is a primary form of communication that if you can't text the girl, chances are she is not going to develop a relationship with you unless you have a lot of face to face proximity. And that can include a family member that can include, include potentially somebody in an intensive coaching relationship. Okay. But still I see texting. All right. So when I have a middle school, upper middle school or a teenage girl as the target, the abuser is looking to once again, select the child and start to develop a relationship. And the relationship in the beginning will seem appropriate. It will seem like, oh, he's such a good kid, man. He really speaks teenager. Well, wow. He's really helping my girl with algebra or he really is helping my child develop skills in playing soccer. I really appreciate you pouring into my kid. You know how you mentor all these teenagers and the way that you're taking time for my child. I just want you to thank you. You know, I travel a lot and you're always having my girl over at your house. Man, that means a lot to me. Thank you for that. Okay. It's that person creating the opportunity to have a relationship. And normally you're going to find texting, Skype, okay, Snapchat. You're going to find those forms of electronic communication. All right. So when it's a teenage boy, what am I looking for? Remember, type of fence I build is driven by what I want to keep out. What is it going to look like? What is the attack going to look like when it's my teenage boy? It's going to be the trusted time alone. It's going to be alcohol. It's going to be rule breaking. It's going to be the weed. It's going to be the porn. It's going to be the edgy banter. It's going to be the horse play. It's going to be wind up being in those things that we go to the lake together and everybody does skinny dipping or we're going to do this travel. We're going to go to Tulsa and we're going to see a minor league baseball game or we're going to leave town with your child. Okay. It's going to be some fun, edgy, cool thing we're going to do and we're going to leave town. That person's looking for isolation. So once that person has selected the child and started to win that child's trust and start to set the hooks and the double hooks, what the abuser wants to do is look for ways to have trusted time alone. Sometimes trusted time alone is easy. It's a family member going, Hey man, I'm going to take your kid to the movies. We're going to go, we're going to get a Sonic. We're going to do whatever. Okay. Sometimes if it's somebody just a step removed from the family relationship, it might be that person manufacturing that trip manufacturing that six flags activity, manufacturing that go see this, you know, football game or whatever. When it's the girl, oftentimes it's going to be form of texting, which deteriorates into body comments, which deteriorates further in the request and in the send of nude photos. Then there's going to be the massages. Then there's going to be the forms of, of giggly, playful touch. Okay, but always in the, seemingly in the context of relationship for her. So, so even one of those situ situations unfolds and gets revealed, oftentimes she's not coming clean 
because she's protecting something. She thinks she's in relationship, don't you see? Hmm. Okay. So when it's a small child, if someone wants to groom, say, a four-year-old or a five-year-old, they're not going to use alcohol, tobacco, porn, weed, and Snapchat. Okay. Because the child's not there with you. Now, it's still the same process. It just looks a little different. Is the person going to gain access? Okay, where is the child that's five years old? Okay, is it in the pre-K? Is it the mom's day out? Or is it in my neighbor's house? All right, that person wants to gain access. Once again, by appearing helpful, trustworthy, and kind. Oh, I'll babysit. Don't worry. I got a pile of my own kids. Just add them to the pack. Oh, you're such a giver. Okay, it could be that person that's just in proximity who's gaining access by serving you, by helping you. Hey, let me take care of that for you. Bring the kids over to my house. Y'all go on a date night. Okay, and all those sound like, oh, dude, that's my neighbor. And I'm not saying that every time there's a situation like that of families playing team ball that somebody's a perp. We just need to not close our eyes. But the abuser wants to gain access, then we'll select the child. And then we'll start to, when it's a very small child, since alcohol, tobacco, porn, weed, Snapchat aren't necessarily the tools in the belt, when it's a small child, what the abuser is still doing is finding out where is that child's barrier to appropriate and are they negotiable. And generally, the abuser is determining where are the barriers and can they be moved and the way it's moved is through repeated forms of pushing those barriers back. The forms of touch, it'll be the side hug. Then it'll be the pick you up and put it on the lap. Then it'll be the tickle game. So the abuser wants to continue to test those barriers and push them back, even if it's overcoming something in the child that the child's uncomfortable with. Repeatedly pushing those, oh, you know, that's just the way Uncle Ed hugs. Oh, that's just the way that coach, you know, disciplines his players. You know, he's got to swat you on the butt. That's the way volleyball works, okay? So it's just the repeated pushing back those barriers because repeatedly pushing back is going to be what makes it ultimately not unacceptable. So for the very small child, what the abuser is looking for is forms of playful touch and places of isolation. And the most common form of playful touch, Patrick, tickling. Memo, most kids don't want to be tickled. Okay, but they'll accept tickling as a form of affection or attention. They're not otherwise getting in some other place or by some other person. Okay, so what the abuser wants to do is put in proximity, gain access to the child, and then start to push that child's barriers back through forms of playful touch and then looking for places of isolation. Sleepovers create great opportunities for places of isolation. Nap time, when you turn off the light, becomes a place of isolation, even if there's a group of kids in that same room, okay? Swimming pools create isolation by virtue of not being able to see what's happening in the water. Natural water is even more difficult, difficult to discern what's happening under the surface. Hot tubs, go ahead and just fill them with sand, okay? So for the abuser, gain access, selecting the child, introducing nudity and sexual touch by the barrier testing, and pushing back those barriers through forms of inappropriate touch, okay? So I know we burned through a lot of time, but I now wanted to make some observations for my dads because you just need, what do I need to see? Listen to the children talk about what activities happens over at that guy's house. Listen for the child who's talking about, these are the comments this guy makes on the group chat. Listen for those ways in which, whether it's a teenage boy or teenage girl, where someone's introducing the comment, the touch, the talk, okay? Because oftentimes you're not, this is not necessarily being done in such a way that you can see it, but I just want you to know what are those things that I am supposed to see. When I hear these guys talking about, oh my gosh, we all went down to the lake with coach such and such and... I mean, that stupid idiot, it's 40 degrees outside, and he took off all his clothes and jumped to the lake and tried to get us to. That's crazy. So when you hear people talking about doing something that's new, even if it's, oh, my God, that's crazy, dude, that's awesome. Oh, have your radar up. That, may not, that guy's just an idiot, perhaps. <laughs> okay? Yeah. But that's what a perp would do, and I don't want my kid hanging out with idiots or perps. Okay? Right. 
So the last step of the grooming process is keeping the child quiet. And sexual abusers are very good at keeping children quiet. Okay, So dads, we need to know these three things. A sexual abuse victim is usually holding on to three pieces of information in my experience. Okay, I don't care if the, if the person being victimized is five or 65 at the time I have the conversation. The first thing that person is holding on to is also the number one reason why children don't tell or sexual abuse victims don't tell. And the number one reason is no one will believe me. You know what's sad about that, dads? Most of the times we don't. Study came out about four years ago. Guess how many times on average a child needed to make an outcry before a criminal investigation would start? Answer, seven times. Wow. Dads, I want you to know that, that starts at home. Okay? So we need to know. That's the one piece of information that is probably true that we don't believe. Now, we need to believe, especially when the Center for Disease Control is teaching us between 92 and 98 percent of all allegations made by children are factual, even if the child recants. OK, so be ready to believe. All right. Now, the other two pieces of information, one is I don't no one will believe me. The other two are somehow it's my fault and I'm the only one. And if you're a dad out there listening to this and you've been sexually abused, you know what I'm talking about. No one will believe me. I'm the only one. And somehow it was my fault. Now, those last two are not true. But we just need to know, especially if your child is a boy or a young man, those three pieces of information are critically important. <coughs> especially as you have ongoing dialogue. So if a child does have the courage to share that with you because they trust you, I want you to be prepared to have those things come out of your mouth in one way or another. It's like, son, I want you to know I believe you. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know, son, it's not your fault. And you're not the only one. And I'm going to come alongside you and we're going to do the next right thing no matter how dark this road gets. That's what the sexual abuse victim needs to hear from you. So the next, just to leave that, Patrick, I wanted to finish with an idea that along that vein, that if a child does come to share, yeah. that I want us to score every point that's available to score while at the same time avoiding a ditch on your left and a ditch on your right. Okay? Sounds good, yeah. The, the, be prepared for a child to come to you, even if it's not your child. If you're one of those dads, that just the people just trust you. They just see like you're the guy that they can count on. Be prepared for someone. It's, they've come to me in student ministry, especially, especially with a handful of my kids who know what I do. They come to me and it's like, Mr. Love, if I tell you something, will you promise not to tell? Okay. Know when a child comes to share something with you, if they finally trust it again and they've identified you as somebody that they can share something which has been their experience, just know at that point you are on your crossroads. Okay, you can go into the ditch or you could do this epically well. Okay, mm. so when a child comes to you and says, Mr. Patrick, if I tell you something, we promise not to tell. Okay, our inclination and just the social contracts, like, well, yeah, you can trust me. Yeah, what, what do you got, man? What's on your mind? Now, if a child tells you about that crush they have on that little girl over there, it's like, damn, I'll take that to my grave. Okay, <laughs> but if some child comes to you and says, Mr. Patrick, if I tell you something, Will you promise not to tell? And you say yes, and then that child tells you about what sexually is happening at their home with their stepfather when the mom leaves the house. Can you keep that secret? No, you can't. You no, know, you cannot. Say something. You've yeah. got to make a report, okay? You should make a report, even if it wasn't the law. But in Pennsylvania and in many states, like it's a mandated report, okay? Right. So you may drop back and realize, dang it, I told that kid I was going to keep this secret, and I realized I had to make a report, and you come back to that child, like, hey, remember when you said, if I could keep your secret, and I told you you could trust me to keep it? Well, I had to make a call, and then you betrayed that child's trust, okay? Just don't get in that ditch. And as a result of that, I want to just put some words in your mouth. If a child comes to you and says, Mr. Patrick, if I tell you something, will you promise not to tell? The answer I want to hear from you in response to that is not if a child's being hurt. I can't keep a secret if a child's being hurt. 
Now, if that child backs up and then stops talking, what has that child just told you? Something's going on, probably. Something's going on, and it gives you the beautiful opportunity to say, but you know what it is? Whatever it is, you know, I'll believe you. Oh. And I'll walk down that road with you no matter how hard and dark it gets. That's awesome. See, that's money right there. Yeah. Okay? But in addition, so there's the ditch on your left. You can't keep secrets. And so as to not get into the position where you're keeping them, just you heard it here in advance. The child asks you, if I tell you something you promise not to tell, it's like, well, not if a child's being hurt and go from there. So if a child backs up and doesn't tell you, that child's told you everything you need to know. Now, no secrets is ditch on the left. Ditch on the right is no shaming questions, dad. And I know if it's your child and your child comes to you and is sharing something with you, dad, I'm telling you what, I am capable of taking life. My child needs me to lay that down. So if my child or any other child comes to you and shares something with you, keep in mind they've probably already been disbelieved two, three, four times. And when they come to you, they might give you something which is just a, a partial disclosure, yeah. something vague, something it's like, you know what, I don't ever want to play soccer again, but you love soccer. Oh, get over it. Get on out there. A child may be telling you something. I had one kid that came to a coach and said, or to a father and said, Dad, I don't ever want to play goalie again. Well, why not, son? You're good at it. I'm always the last one left in the locker room with the coach when he wants to shower because I have to take off all the equipment. That was what got that dad's attention. That's what led him to understand that the cho coach chose that child as the goalie to keep that child in the locker room and wouldn't help him take off his equipment until the coach was already partially new. Okay. So mm -hmm. just be prepared for the child, you know, to share with you if they have a serious departure from something they love to do or the person they've liked to be around. Okay. Be sensitive to the vaguer partial disclosures, but no shaming questions. Okay, so what is a shaming question? Shaming question is any question that might imply that the child was responsible in some way or the child didn't do something the child should have done. So I'll have circumstances where a child will come to a parent and say, Dad, can I tell you something? You know, this is what happened to me last night. What? Well, why didn't you run? Okay, there's a natural you know, fire in my belly. They're like, baby, run. But what, what is the message to the child when someone says, why didn't you run? It was their fault. They did something wrong. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you know what, dad, that's on me. You're right. Yeah. Other examples of shaming questions. What were you wearing? Why didn't you scream? How long has this been going on? Why didn't you tell me sooner? What time did this happen? And see, all that may be great information that you'd want to know, but save it because it has a shaming element in it. Do you see that? Yeah. So the, I want us to respond well when a child comes to you. So listen and respond calmly. Know that you may have to pick up the phone, but even putting that aside, be sensitive to vague or partial disclosures, no secrets, and no shaming questions. Now, from 30,000 feet, secrecy is a huge element of this grooming process. Dad, what would I tell you to make a priority, especially for your very small children? Start weaving into your culture, no secrets in our house. When my child was very young, the baby girl, I want you to know between me and mama, I will never ask her to keep a secret. For, I will never ask you to keep a secret from her. And she will never ask you to keep a secret from me. We don't keep secrets in our house. In fact, in our house, that's exactly the opposite. See, when somebody asks us to keep a secret, we immediately tell the other. And then we role play it. And then we bring her into it. So at a very young age, here's what I know. If somebody wants to take my kid into a harm's way involving sexual abuse, you're going to have to convince my kid to keep a secret, and you're going to make my kid uncomfortable. So if I get on that turf when my child is very young, such that she knows we don't keep secrets, Anybody trying to convince my child to keep a secret, good luck. Anybody trying to convince my child that my daddy, your daddy won't believe you, good luck. You know, also uncomfortable. Baby, when's the last time someone's made you uncomfortable? I always want to know when someone's made you uncomfortable. See, I didn't tell my child, I don't want anybody to have sex with you. My child at four. What? Okay. I don't need to say the word sex or penis. Okay. I just 
they're going to make my child uncomfortable in this touch that my child is not desiring and not prepared for. So if somebody's pushing the barriers with my child, it makes her uncomfortable. And I am regularly asking her, baby, when's the last time someone's made you uncomfortable? Well, you know, daddy, Aunt Cheryl makes me uncomfortable. This is a real life situation, by the way. So really, baby, what's, that, what's weird about Aunt Cheryl? Daddy, she has a mustache. <laughs> okay. So you got to be prepared for what makes the child uncomfortable. But nonetheless, that is a regular right pedal, left pedal dialogue between my child and I. Yeah. And as she grew up, now she understood as she starts hearing from her friends. She had even a friend tell her in the third grade that she was sexually abused by a grandfather. And my child, when I asked her, baby, when's the last time someone's asked you to keep a secret? She goes, daddy, I can't tell you. And I said, baby, you've got to tell me because that's the way our family works. And she wound up telling me, and I had to make a phone call. And it messed up Christmas at that little girl's house. Okay. But it was still the best thing that's ever happened to her to protect her from a situation and start a healing process. Is because my little girl knew I can't keep that secret. Okay. Wow. So creating that in your culture, in your families. Now, I want to warn you that pendulum can go too far. I had one particular girl here in the Metroplex who was sexually abused by a pastor. Okay, and it was she was on sleepover with that pastor's six-year-old daughter. So that pastor is using his own kids as bait to bring in children, you know, spending the night and victimizing them. And her, the protective world at her home was her dad telling her, "Baby, I want you to know, anybody so much as touches you or talks to you dirty, I'll kill them." Hmm. Now, that dad thought he was going over the top. I was like, yeah, I just manned up and showed my little girl that I mean business. But as soon as that abuse happened, what did she believe? She thought her dad was going to kill that guy. That's exactly right. And the guilt was on her now because she knew if she told her daddy would kill him and he would go to prison and she would lose her daddy. Mm. And so she never told until she was 28 years old because that's when her father died. Wow. So in that situation, the dad thought he was going over the top in child protection when all he really did without knowing it was kept his child quiet. So we need to understand what is valuable and what is not. And even though there's another conversation, Patrick, for you and I to have, it starts with an understanding of the grooming process. And once you understand grooming, these additional conversations can now start to make sense. Yeah, man. Wow. Well, Greg, man, I am just blown away by how you so meticulously and methodically laid out the grooming process, the four steps that that the uh, preferential offender will go through. And I, I really appreciate the the part at the end where you talk specifically and give us words, give us a script for how to approach a situation when our child discloses some information and how to handle that and ha how to how to kind of walk that tightrope because that as you've have you given some examples it's a very very fine line between shaming the child and actually get getting them to feel comfortable or going the other way where where the father was overprotective or um, just over the top with things, and it and it made it even more so for the daughter to not disclose. And um, I'm just I'm just blown away, man, blown away. I really appreciate it. Okay, well then you drop back, you hear from your dads, and you find out what is our next conversation. And let's just let's keep this thing rolling. Maybe it's going to be about peer to peer sexual abuse. Maybe it's going to be about you know certain contexts. Like, what does it look like to vet a camp, you know, or an after school program or, 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 or. So I'll leave that up to you and let you derive this train. Um, so get some feedback from your dads and let's don't let this ride end. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put the link in the show notes for the, the awareness training that, that you provided us with the free one. And I know I have a lot of pastors and youth pastors um, in the community and, and our, that are listeners. And so that might be a good conversation to have uh, not just with the camps, but about how to make sure that the church is secure and the, the youth functions um, are secure. Because, you, you know, most churches do, they do criminal background checks. And we talked about this last time. They do criminal background checks, do a child abuse clearance, and they think these, you know, 
anybody that passes those is good to go. But what we now know is only 4% of the people are going to show up there. And those aren't going to be the people that are going to be applying to work with children anyway. And so um, I think that might make a, a really good conversation. But uh, all right, man. Well, thank you so much. I, I really do appreciate it, Greg. And um, looking forward to hearing some more from you. You got it, man. I'll stand by. All right, brother. Take care and have a happy Thanksgiving. All right. Ciao. All right, gentlemen, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope our conversation was a blessing to you and that you leave this episode better equipped to be the man and the father God has called and created you to be. If so, then I ask that you please leave us a five-star rating and a quick written review in iTunes. And make sure you head on over to the show notes to get all of the resources for this episode. While you're there, you can take part in our five days to be a better dad challenge, as well as get involved with our free Facebook community. All right, gentlemen, until next week, remember Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Stay sharp.